Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is a, our favorite event of the semester. Um, the Two Rivers Reading Series Committee would like to all welcome and thank you. And I'd like to say a special thank you to the committee members, especially Paige Real for organizing this event today. Thank you so much. Give her a round of applause. Also, Chris McCarthy in the back on video. <laughs> Melody Hyde on photography and crowd control and questions later. And Catherine Rock, our new newest committee member. If she's here, can you stand, Catherine? And we'd like to say hi and thank you for helping us this semester. Um, the Two Rivers Reading Series at Anoka Ramsey Community College is proud to present our Fall 2018 event, um, a reading and discussion with Leslie Neka Arima, author of the short story collection, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky. What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky is Arima's intriguing and award-winning debut collection of short stories. Arima expertly takes readers on a journey between Nigeria and the United States, between mothers and daughters, and between suffering and love in energetic stories infused with a refreshing dose of humor. Arima won the Minnesota Book Award for Novel and Short Story in 2017, the 2017 Kirkus Prize, and the 2017 New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award for What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Arima. so many of you read Leslie's book in your class and I know you've talked about it in class and written about it and we're happy to have her here and uh, she just flew in from Vermont so we just skidded in here in the last few minutes so we're happy to have her here and I want to start out with congratulating you Leslie you posted on social media the other day that you just found out you'd won the 2018 bridge book award for fiction from the American Initiative for Italian Culture. So that means you get a trip to Rome. So what it means when a man falls from the sky has won several other awards, including the Minnesota Book Award, the Kirkus Award for Fiction, and the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award. So my first question was, how has your life changed since you published this debut short story collection, and what impact has all of these awards had for you? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, well, I started doing my dishes, so it's, it's, it's one of those weird things where it's, the awards mean something, obviously, but they don't, they haven't affected my day-to-day -day life. It's just more of my professional life. Um, and so it has been um, an adjustment from uh, writing where, at a point where nobody cared what I was producing to the point where people are anticipating and have expectations on their students. Um, and so it has sort of created this weird moment for me. Well, we wanted to maybe open with uh, a couple of just short excerpts. So would you maybe read something from Light? Sure. A favorite part of yours from the short story, Light? Oh, I always love the beginning, so I'll read from the beginning. Okay, Light. When an Emily Okara sent his girl out in the world, he did not know what the world did to daughters. He did not know how quickly it would wick the deal off her, how she would be returned to him hollowed out, relieved of her better parts. Before this, they are living in Portakot, in a bungalow in the old Agwanda layout. The girl's mother is in America, reading for a master's in administration. 
She has been there for almost three years in which her 11-year-old son of a girl has been. And the Billy and the girl have thrived much in her absence, including a stampede at the market that separated them for hours, shoppers fleeing a promotion that turned out to be two warring market women who had just about enough of each other's tomatoes. They survived a sex talk, birthed by a careless joke an uncle had made at a wedding about the bride taking a cup of palm wine to her husband and leaving with a cup of, well, and the girl had questions he might as well answer before she asked someone who would take it as an invitation to demonstrate. They survived the crime scene of the girl's first period, where she proved to be as heavy a bleeder as she was a sleeper, the red seeping all the way through to the other side of the mattress. They survived the girl discovering that it happened every month. Thank you. So we gathered questions from students, and we're using those questions to guide uh, what we're going to ask Leslie today. And if your question doesn't get answered, don't worry. There will be a short question and answer period at the end of our interview. And then after that, Leslie will sign a copy of your book if you're interested. So the, the first question is from student Allison Jilberg who asked, there seems to be a common theme of young girls growing up and the experiences they have as they mature, which is just what you read from life. Do you write these short stories with your own experiences of relationships, problems, or life lessons in mind? And if not, where do you gather inspiration from? Um, you know, I, you know I, yes, I was, I was once a girl. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't write autobiography, but uh, I do write from my own imagination, and I do write, um, you know, sort of with the, the questions that I have about the world in mind, and I'm very interested in what the sort of the, the journey that a girl goes through to become a woman, right? And so that is an area that I, you know, I find, you know, interesting and fascinating and, and worthy of being, you know, uh, worthy of my imagination and being documented in a literary way. Um, and so while these experiences are not sort of directly relational to my life or are experiences that are based on things that happen to me, they do sort of cover the ground that, um, that interests me just based on my own curiosity or that ground that interests me based on what I experience but not necessarily the exact situation on the page. Thank you. So kind of a follow-up to that, um, there's a, a lot of questions revolved around people being interested in the mother-daughter dynamic in a lot of these stories. And so student Danielle Newman asked, in a few of the stories like Windfalls, Second Chances, and Wild, there's a strong presence of mother-daughter relationships and their dis difficulties. Is there any reason as to why you decided to incorporate an issue like this in so many of your stories in the book? Well, I also have a mother. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's, it's, fun, it's funny, you know, I, I think of um, parental relationships and I generally tend to focus on mother-daughter relationships because I am a daughter and if I have a child, I will be a mother. And so that's the relationship that most interests me. But you know, there are so many ways that this relationship can look like. Um, even if they, whether they are positive ways or negative, like there's so many ways for them to be negative, there's so many ways for them to be positive. And it seems to me that it, that, the, that creates an endless possibility for um, area to explore uh, in literature. And, um, and I don't know, like it's something, there's just something about that particular way, because you know, that it's, you're, generally, your mother is, the first person that socializes you, right? And so it's, you know, we all, you know, it's, a, it's an important relationship and we all sort of acknowledge that, but, um, you know, beyond just it being an important relationship, I just wanted to explore the different possibilities for what a relationship like that could look like. Thank you. So kind of a, another follow-up to this is a lot of the students had questions about the story Windfalls, which is your only story told in second-person <coughs> point of view. And Professor Steve Bestie's class was interested in knowing, so it's pretty terrible what happens in that story. We have a, a mother and daughter crisscrossing the United States and pulling scams on people. And the mother is really kind of abusing this daughter uh, in the way that she's being treated. And so why was it that you decided you wanted to write that story in second person, which often will kind of pull a reader in and, and make 
him or her feel a lot closer to the characters. Yeah, um, I wish I could say that I had um, a literary reason for doing that. I did not. It, it was just sort of the, it was the way the story first came to me, right? Um, but you know, I did at one point experiment with switching it to first person, and it just was not the same story. Um, and my general theory about you know the like second person is first of all you can't do it for too long because it gets annoying for a reader to, to I, it's not me you 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 but, you know it gets annoying for a reader to engage with that um, constantly but I think that the you know, second person voice tends to work if the experience on the page is so different from anything that the reader would sort of you know, feasibly be going through that they're not. Like they're not necessarily implicated um, directly in the text, and so in this case, uh, you know, while I did not sort of have a conscious reading one reason when I first generated the story for having it in second person, um, it it is it does it does, it does fulfill my theory. So I'm going to share that. Yes. So it has that really devastating ending. So one student had asked, how did you want this story to make your readers feel? <laughs> oh, awful, yes. <laughs> I really enjoy fucking with people. It's really, it delights me. But no, I mean, you know, it is, uh, you know, I, uh, I tend to, um, I tend to be interested in difficult things and uh, and so, you know, there, there tends to be, you know, there are difficult parts of um, a lot of my stories, and that one in particular. Um, and so, I, I hope you felt terrible, because you should. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay, we did, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one student, since we're talking about conflicts, one student, Natalie Schlichter, had asked about the common reoccurrence of internal conflicts, such as mental health issues and external conflicts such as physical abuse and so was one of your purposes in writing the, the short story collection to bring awareness to those subjects? Um, no um, and I say that because uh, when I'm when I'm writing I I cannot I cannot write if I have a an agenda in mind right it's just not a place um, that encourages my creativity or, or my imagination and so my allegiance is to the, the story, to the character, to their journey, and not necessarily to like, a message um, that the piece is supposed to um, impart. Um, I mean, like, you know, it's a, it's a happy accident that um, certain things are brought to awareness, but when I approach the page, um, the story is the forefront of my, um, in my mind and not um, sort of, not like, these larger, larger issues. And they, these things appear in the work over and over because these are issues that exist in the world and I am again interested in the world and interested in difficult things and so um, and so like that's where my curiosity takes me. It takes me to to those places. So similarly then do you not intentionally write with the kind of a feminist lens or does that just um, well, I mean, you know, my favorite saying is put all men in a blender, so I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I, you know, I, I think that, um, I know it's a good one, right? Um, I think that, uh, I think that like, my natural pro proclivities come out, right? And so, you know, I, I, I am interested in women and girls and interested in the plight of women and girls. And so that's where I lend my imagination. Um, and so I, I am, uh, as far as and, you know, I am interested in in you know in, you know, in equity between um, in between the genders etc cetera, etc, cetera. Uh, but again you know it it comes across in the work because that's just part of my internal framework, but I don't necessarily have in mind oh I'm going to write a feminist story now it's just um, it's just the way it works out. Um, so you had mentioned when you read Light that beginnings are, you really enjoy beginnings. Do your beginnings happen kind of naturally, or are these stories that started somewhere else and then you decided, ah, I don't need those first three paragraphs, I'm going to start here, right? Um, it depends. So some of them started differently, um, but with usually the way my process works with short stories um, is that uh, like a, you know a character will appear to me or a situation or whatever, and I will just think about it for um, a long time, and a long time that does not look like I'm doing anything productive, but I am, I swear. Um, and so I just think about the story, the characters, and I work out some of the logistics of like the plots and things in my head, 
and I, I'd like to call it like my brewing <coughs> process. So I just I just brews in my head for some time, and then when it comes to a boil, <laughs> metaphor. When it comes to boil, I just like I, I write it. I write it out. Like it spills over, and I, I write the I write the story out. Um, and so every once in a while, I do get like a first paragraph. Um, uh, for example, so lights was one where it started like the story. You know, again, came to me. It sounds so woo woo. It's not really that woo woo. Um, came to me as you know, one that really a part of that. And same with um, Who Would Be at Home. I think I had that first paragraph Who Would Be at Home in a folder for almost a year. I and mean, just that first paragraph while the story was just brewing in its own thing in my subconscious. And then, um, and then like it was still ready to be ready. Yeah. So several students had asked about. How long does it take you to write a short story, and how long did it take you to put this whole collection together? Um, so, uh, how long it takes you to write a short story? I mean, it really, it really does depend. Um, there are <laughs> stories that, you know, because because I do this brewing process, I can say something. Oh, I wrote the story in a couple of days, and it sounds like oh, I just like sat down and decided to write a couple. Of days. But no, it's you know, it it lived in my head for however long weeks, months. Um, in the case of Ruby at home, almost a full year um, before, and so you know the, the actual process of writing it um, may have happened quicker than the actual process of putting the story together um, in my head. And then there are other stories that happen a little bit more traditionally, where you know a paragraph here, a paragraph there. Um, uh, Bucci's Girls is one of those stories where um, you know I, I was working in that story for you know a couple of a couple of months, and it was just it just it just unfolded very slowly, um, and so and then you know went back and revised and etc. Moved things around, and so yeah. So we talked a little bit about beginnings, um, and there were also lots of questions about the endings okay. of your stories. And so uh, one of the question was just that one statement was that you just don't often neatly resolve the conflict. And so uh, there was a question from Professor Bestie's students. They wanted to know if you choose the endings deliberately to challenge readers to imagine for themselves how the stories might end, or do you think the endings can be understood if the readers simply consider the evidence in the story more um, fully? Um, yes, yes to both, yes. Um, so, you know, I, I once had a writing, um, uh, you know, a workshop leader who said uh, something along the lines of, if the you know like you know abrupt endings right only work or the you know, surprise, abrupt, abrupt endings surprise endings only work if the reader can um, like imagine what comes next can like feasibly imagine what comes next like, that it's not so it's not so open ended that there are um, that there's like that they that there's a huge question mark about you know. Did the, did the aliens invade? Like you know, like there's like there, are, you know, maybe two options. Like you know, it's it's a, a manageable sort of you know, um, uh, thing to imagine what the ending would be. And so, uh, and so with that in mind, you know, I I did not I did not necessarily set out to challenge your reader. Like as far as I'm concerned, all of these stories like finished pretty neatly, so I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll tell you. Okay, so um, students really want to know about Glory. Yes. Does she marry Thomas and go to Nigeria or not? Um, I can't answer that, of course. I know, that's why you're here, because guess one leaves. So here's the thing. It doesn't matter what she chose. And when you figure out why it doesn't matter what she chose, you'll know what she chose. All right, my students, five Riddles. pages by Monday, answer that question. <laughs> OK, well, I don't imagine we're going to get a clear answer from you on these either. But since students are asking, I will follow up. Does the narrator of Windfalls really continue to be her mother's accomplice in these scams? <laughs> It's done. Like this, it's, it's written. It's, it's there. <laughs> I, I cannot answer logistic questions like that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, I believe it was Professor um, Laurel Osterkamp, students from Columbia Heights, that wanted you to make. I think it was Wild. Am I right? Into a novel. Where are her students? Was it Wild? 
Yeah, they want you to make that into a novel. Is that a possibility? Add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on to something you, you probably uh, can answer. So many uh, student Callum MacArthur had asked throughout many of the stories. It seems like most of the characters either originated from or have some form of ties to Nigeria. Along with this, many parts of the stories actually occurred there as well. And why do you use Nigeria as a center of focus? And was this to pay homage to where you grew up, or was there another motive? I mean, it's like it's it's where I'm from, so it's um, it's like part of my DNA. It's like asking you why why are you telling stories in the United States. And so I live in the United States, but I you know like I. Uh, the, my dad was my dream. I mean, it's like I mean, like it's like go back and forth, and so it's it's like part it's like just part of my DNA, part of my my sort of cultural makeup. Yeah. Okay. Um, student Sky Campbell asked a question about the future looks good. And she asked why you use the title, The Future Looks Good, and that story for the opening story, when obviously that story ends with Godwin shooting as in my in the back. Why did you choose to open the book with a story that concludes with a violent death? That's a good question. So um, I am actually really terrible at titles. Um, so just to address that, first of all, like I, you know, I, well, I'm almost embarrassed to say this. My original title, because I get terrible at titles, completely uninventive with titles. It's like family tree. I was like, oh, it was really, really, really bad. <laughs> and a friend of mine said, I'm not going to let you do that to the story. And what are you doing? Um, and so she said, well, what, like, you know, like, okay, so, like, you know, let's look at the, you know, recurring whatever. So it's like, well, you know, that's my, her name, her name's appear, her name appears, um, you know, pretty often. Like, what does, what, what does it mean? And it, the beginning of the future looks good. And it's like, are you kidding me? It's the perfect title. Um, and I, the science just started off with that, um, with that story because I figured, I mean, it's, it's the punchiest one, right? But I also figured, I mean, it, I'll let you know where you're getting into pretty, you know, pretty early. Um, and also, it <coughs> when I originally envisioned the order for the collection, I decided, I thought I was going to start with the most, most realistic, real world gritty, and then like build up to like, the most fantastic, you know, more magical. And my editor said that. Um, and so, you know, she, her idea was to pair the stories by like theme or whatever, but in each case, both of us put that story first. And it was just something about about it that just um, I think it it is a it was a good it was a good signal for like what what I, what I do with my work and what my work looks like. And, and incidentally, it's also of these stories the first one that I wrote. And so um, yeah, it just seemed like a natural beginning. So one student had asked, were there any stories that you wrote that you were hoping would be in the book and then got cut? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, there was a story that I was working on, and it was um, set in, you know, like, you know, like a, you know, the stranger version of our world. In this particular world, um, girls had to disrobe at puberty and remain naked until they got married and like their husband gifts to them like a white cloth or whatever. And I was working on this story for a while and it, my editor and I kept sending it back and forth and I swear I made it worse every single time. <laughs> um, and I just I just realized that I was not yet the writer I needed to be to like pull that, the story off. And so instead of like, holding up the whole book while I figured this out, I just said, you know, and, and something about also, like the feeling like someone was breathing down my neck reading the story was not conducive to actually getting it done. Um, and so I decided to pull it and, and just like work on it on my own time. And I, I eventually did, did figure, out, figure it out, so yeah. And did I see you just got that one published? Yes, yes. it just got published. All right, um, so you mentioned magical realism and Professor Jasmine Ziegler's students asked, how do you balance the stories with magical realism with the stories that are more realistic? For example, when the mother returns from the dead in Second Chances. Yes, so um, I think of you know, stories with magical elements, that's like a, there's three different kinds. There's our world, but different, which is, you know, it's our world, but there's something a little different. So everything's the same, there are no aliens, there are no, you know, everyone has two arms, etc. Um, and then there's our world much changed, and this is like dystopias, and you know, um, usually falls into this category into the brand new world, just where you're just creating something like essentially a new lot of So with stories that are our world but different, like Second Chances, 
the like whatever the thing that's different has to put it has to be a significant difference. Like it can't just be, oh, the grass is purple in this world, right? It has to be something that puts pressure on either you know societal or emotional pressure, or like the societal framework or emotional pressure on the character. Um, and I always think of you know the thing that we say, like people say when we when we lose someone, we say, yeah, oh, if I, have, if, I, if I could just have one more day, you know, and you have all these sort of rarefied ideas of what you're going to do, um, and that's not something that I could explore with or in a real world, in a story that's entirely realistic. Um, and so in, this, in that particular case, the magical element of the story allowed me to explore this particular human question with like this inhuman invention. Yeah. So we have um, very surprising twists and turns in the story, uh, Who Will Greet You at Home, where the protagonists and other young women create babies out of various objects. And that story takes some shocking plot twists including the intense climax where the mother battles and burns her hair baby up. So many students were curious <laughs> about... That's because we say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Well, that's why you're a fiction writer. I'm not. Uh, many students were really curious about that story. So uh, Joseph Hartley asked, what is the symbolism of the babies starting as everyday objects in the story who will greet you at home? And how did you come up with this idea? Oh, hmm. So the significance, it's not, that, it's not necessarily that they represent something, but I, you know, when I was sort of creating this world, like I, you know, I had this imagination, like I didn't imagine this particular world, I, as with any, with, with any time I'm, I'm sort of creating, you know, a, a magical world, I start asking myself like logistical questions. Um, and so one of the questions is like, well, if people are making their children out of it, like, what are they making them out of, right? Um, and so everyone isn't going to have access to the same types of materials. Like, you know, people who are wealthier will have, will have finer materials. People who are not will have access to just like what they can get their hands on. And so it, you know, it's a, it became like a class, it's a class marker essentially, like what, what you are able to build your child up of that signals with which class you belong to, um, and so so that's sort of um, what the you know the you know, put the if, if anything that's what the, the children symbolize. Um, as for where I got the idea, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think story ideas just sort of again come to me, which sounds so woo woo and ridiculous, but but every once in a while. Something like something will happen. Something like that will occur to me, um, just out of the blue. Like it just something. Uh, you know, there, there had to have been something that sparked it, um, but I have since forgotten what what it was. Um, but you know, I, I find stories everywhere. So you know, um, I just finished teaching Exit West to um, to uh, my students in Vermont, and one of you know, like there's a line in there. Um, about you know a woman who who a, a, a maid and she's just she's just called the maid she's not given a name but she you know the, there's reference talk about how like she her body has aged but her mistress's body has not right and it's and you know and like you know and the line is something like it's as though she were hired not to cook and clean but to age in her mistress's stead and I thought what a wonderful premise for a story like to have. Like, what would that look like if, if, you could, if you could hire someone to, to like age for you or whatever? And I realized that, oh, that's altered carbon. Somebody wrote that. But you know, like, it was like the, the stories, stories, like things like that will sort of spark an idea. And then now, and now it's, it's an idea that's living in my head now. And, and I, I'm thinking logistically about things. And, and like, by the time it is a story, like the journey from the idea, like I might have. I might have ended up far from the idea. The idea could just have been like uh, the inciting incident that led to what was eventually the story, or it might, and or the, or the idea might be the story. But it's just, yeah, it's just, just like being in the world and, and being curious. Yeah. So Professor Catherine Scores students asked, in most of your stories, specifically, who will greet you at home and what it means when a man falls from the sky, humanity has become dark and unkind. How does this reflect your personal opinion on humanity and the state of the world? We are all terrible. Um, <laughs> most, I mean, like, yeah, no, I, mean, I, 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 am, I am somewhat pessimistic about, about people, and I, and I think that 
given the absence of consequences, a good number of us would become our worst selves. And um, I mean, like, you know, in, in a minor way, right? So, so when I'm living alone, I, like, I, I hate doing dishes, and so, you know, I, I guess to the point where I'm like, drinking my coffee out of my tiny glass, I don't want to wash them up. <laughs> and, like, you know, without somebody else looking over my shoulder, I just, like, I just like, be, like, be, like, regress into, um, like, you know, my, like, my caveman ancestor. And so, you know, like, I just, like, it's, it's a, a microcosm of, like, a larger thing where I think, I mean, you know, I, I know it's extremely pessimistic, and, you know, there, there are many theories that, that, you know, disagree with this and possibly disprove it. But I, I generally think of, of people as um, as sort of behaving because they have to, and so um, and you know it, it, it bears out in many little ways that when when we are we, when we know that we are free from consequence, like people tend to act poorly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in what it means when a man falls from the sky, the story, you've created a sort of futuristic dystopia where the protagonist, Neoma, can calculate and remove the grief from others, which ultimately takes a horrible turn at the end. Um, and Jamie Walling uh, had asked, this seems like the most unique of all the stories to me. The concept of how Neoma is able to calculate grief reminded me of artificial intelligence being able to mimic humans. Were you inspired by AI technology or any other specific technology when writing the story? And similarly, uh, Tim Bees in Professor Kaiser's class asked, did you have any specific influence that inspired the dystopia in what it means when a man falls from the sky? Um. Uh, I wish I could say, I do have an interest in, in AI, because I think they're all coming for us, right? Um, and so, like, you know, that is, like, that's something that I, I think about and, and, um, and, and sometimes write about, but in this particular case, the um, AI was not what led me to, um, to this. And, um, God, it came to me in a dream. Um, so, so, okay. So I have I have a notebook that I keep by my bed and like by, by notebook I mean my phone um, because I, I'm, I'm always I'm like it's I will I will lose everything that I own but my phone right and so it's just the most logical place to put anything that's precious to me it's like a fun to me actually and so I um, so I have a you know a digital notebook and um, that I just keep ideas that's like ideas you write that you know things like ideas and so like you know and things, you know, ideas that I get for stories or, you know, phrases, whatever, like, it's, it's just like a repository of just, you know, my, like, spillover from my imagination, right? And, you know, you'll, you'll never remember any of it, so always write it down. Um, and so I, um, I thought, you know, I, I had a dream, and in the, the this, oh God, I hate this woo-woo stuff. Okay, so I had, I had a dream, and in this dream, it, like, you know, like, I, what I remembered of the dream was, like, a man called into the sky. And it was it was a world in which like people like flew right, um, and um, and like there was and like there was like something mathematical about about why he was able to do that. And I've always been really really interested in, in math. I've always like, loved loved math, and so um, so like, you know, that wasn't surprised that that sort of happened. Um, and just, well, you know, I wrote you know, wrote down the little like oh what was it doing on the ramp? Who's mine? You know, that as like a little prompt for myself. Um, and so I started writing the story. And I essentially started doing, like, asking myself these logistical questions, like, what does this, what does a world look like that this makes sense, right? What does a world look like that this makes sense, and that, and that the uh, uh, the person falling is remarkable, right? Because if, if people are just like flying around here and there, I mean, you know, and so and so, you know, it's okay. So eventually, like, okay, so not everyone, everyone's not flying. It was not. It's like it's like we're flying in traffic to work or so and stuff, right? So we have to make it a unique situation for um, the you know this uh, event, but it still it still wasn't enough story. I think still. Uh, I still wanted, I wanted to complicate things, and so I went to my, um, my little digital folder for uh, various ideas that I had, and I just sort of scrolled down until I came across one that I'd written called Grief Eater. And so, uh, and so I, I decided to like blend the, those two premises, right? Something that you know, consumes grief, eats grief, and um, this man fall from the sky, and the world that came out of the dystopia, the flooding, etc. It, it 
you know, part of it, like, I, I had one, always wanted to write like a, a dystopia, um, because it's coming, guys. But also, <laughs> I wanted, um, you know, it, it, it was a result of, again, just like asking myself the like, logistical questions, like where, what does a world look like where these two things make sense together? Like how, how can I construct a world where this, this, this can be possible? And, and out of answering those questions, the story. And then you're able to get that intense plot, but also the rich characters too right. that have those complexities. So that segues perfectly into a question from student Logan Miller, who asked, in what it means when a man falls from the sky, you write, quote, what would happen if you couldn't forget if every emotion from every person whose grief you'd eaten came back up? What did this quote mean to you as you wrote it, and what are your thoughts on taking on others' grief? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, Again, with the like thinking about the, the like you know, if grief is some sort of like mathematical energy, energy has to go somewhere, right? It does not like energy does never it never it does disappear. It, it goes, and so I it was sort of following the logic of, of the math. But what it mean you know what it means? So I I've, I've had a lot of people who are in counseling work write to me about the, the, that story and how. The, how it felt like it, um, like it was, it was like that. That concept was familiar to them. That um, you know, you you are you are here to help, but you are also you are also a person who is who can also be overwhelmed by these you know the, the, whatever it is that you're bringing your bringing your patient through. And so you know, I uh, I wanted. I mean, you know, yes, you know, of course, you know, part of it, part of, part of all of this is like you know. If you understand just how pessimistic I am, that answers like half your questions, right? Uh, but also, I wanted to um, to sort of think about okay, what 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 it does, what it means to to take on so much of other people, what it means for for you know people who work in um, you know in crisis zones, people who uh, who, uh, you know, counsel, counsel people who've been through unimaginable, you know, circumstances. Like what, what it does to a person, right? And um, and and you know, like, yeah, like you know, counselors need counselors too, right? And so yeah. Thank you. So I'm just going to ask one more question, and then we will uh, ask. It'll be your opportunity from the audience to ask uh, Leslie questions. So please figure out what you want to ask. And we will have a, co a colleague of mine will be walking around with a microphone um, to hand you the microphone. And we'll just ask you to briefly ask your question and hand the microphone right back so the colleague can get to someone else in the room while Leslie's answering. So what is your advice to the aspiring writers in the room? We have an AFA program, a lot of students who are interested in, in being writers. What's your best advice? Get a job. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and, yeah, I say that I've actually too. So you know, when I first when I first you know sort of graduated from my movie program, I'm like I want you know wanted to be a writer. I was I was doing I you know I, I worked I was teaching and I was also doing freelance writing, and I was and I found very quickly that especially with like the freelance writing, which seems oh it's great you sit at home in your pajamas and you you know you're writing you make money. Um, you know, money-ish, right? But you know, I found that um, like it drew from the same well that my my writing did, especially if I was required to be like creative in my writing, right? So I so like at that you know, I was doing a lot of um, uh, like en encyclopedia stuff for Cengage, and so I it would be required researching and then like writing these encyclopedia entries, and so it was just you know required for creativity, etc. And it just drew a lot out of me. It drew a lot out of me, and it made it impossible for me to. Um, to, to work, uh, to do to do any of my own creative work, um, and so I sold out and went to corporate America. And it was great. It was great. They gave you health insurance. They, no, you know, it was so I I, you know, I, I didn't sell it completely, but you know, I I got a job at uh, like it was just like a, a, an office job, and I was I mean like you know I was sort of a glorified um, admin assistant, right? It was like I was working at a, a, a at a uh, accounting firm, and I was just like I was, I was a tax processor, which was almost like an admin position. But what it meant was that the the like the second I got on the elevator, I was done. I was done for the day. And I think that sometimes, like we we are we are, especially as artists, we're sold this idea that 
your like you know like you, you want to like use your, your art needs to be like the source of your income etc like the like, the ways to be successful or whatever um, and it's like you know like when, especially when you're starting out your art is like it's it's a baby it's a, it's a cute little toddler that's still learning to walk and you're like sending it into the mines to earn money for you right <laughs> and so you know so you don't like so you know you don't feel as though that you are sort of you know that you are, you know, uh, uh, not fulfilling yourself because you are working like, you know, a jobby job as opposed to like, you know, being an artist. Um, because, you know, like, what what it did is that it, it, it freed me. It freed me because it provided uh, like space in terms of like, you know, like I, I was not, I, would, I did not have the pressure on my writing to be the thing that was like, you know, making my living. And it was a job that was so divorced from what I was writing, or what I, my, my creative life, that it did not, like I was never a creative process, right? And, um, and it also just, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it bought me time. It bought me time and it meant that because I was not, it was, I was not drawing from this creative well to be doing it in, in all other directions, um, it meant that I was reserved my entire self for my, for my work and I did not need to, like I didn't need my job to fulfill me because I had my art to do that. I had my art to do that and I was able to give my art everything that I had because my job was the place that I went to, you know, like fudge tax returns. I mean, I didn't think fudge tax returns. Um, the other advice, the other kind of advice for writers, um, I mean, and you, you know, that, this is not gonna be strange news to you, your, your professors have probably have told you this, is to read. And you know, it's, um, and the reason you've heard it a lot because it's, it really is, is true, that's how it works. Um, you, you have to read. Um, I would push it further and say, read, read everything. Um, read things that are not like what you wanna write. Read things that are not the genres that you will typically think of yourself as being interested in. Because what happens when you read sort of this multi, you know, sort of read multi-genre, you know, read across, you know, whatever, you know, uh, science fiction, fantasy, you know, literary work, romance, westerns, whatever. Like what, and once, when you read all of these works, you start to see a commonality in just how story works, right? And you know, the genre, might, genres change, but story doesn't, and the way story works doesn't. And so, the more you read, and the more varied the um, stuff that you read, there's just like the more of how to tell a story you that you becomes part of your DNA, part of your skill set. So. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. So if you have a question for Leslie, please raise your hand and Melody will come around. Please do limit yourself to just one question and then hand the mic right back to her. Thank you. Um, hi, I'd like to ask you if you would ever collaborate with someone to write a book. Would I ever collaborate with someone to write a book? Huh. I don't know. I don't think so. Like, maybe, okay, a graphic novel, maybe because I can't draw for shit, but not <laughs> like a book book. I don't know. I don't think so. I think that, um, I think my ego is too big. I really do. I would think that my way is the correct way, and who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't think I can play well with others in that way. Um, okay, I was just gonna ask. In the story, when Paul's the mother and daughter relationship is a very negative relationship. What would you say to someone who has the similar sort of relationship? In which story? In Windfalls. Windfalls. What would I say to someone who has a similar? Um, adulthood is escape. Uh, you get to choose your own family at some point. Right, so you can't help who you were born to and and who raised you, but um, you do you, you do get to the point where you have enough freedom to find the family that is out there for you and the people who like, you find your tribe, right? And your tribe is out there, and even and you know. It's, yeah, it's the difference between like you know the, the family that you have and the family that you choose, and there you get to, you you get to a point in your life where you have to really choose your family, and like that that is that is uh, that's what I say. Um, um, in in 
wild. Sorry, in wild. Yeah. So why was it that the mom of Chinere, like, why did she refer to Chinere's son as her brother, even in the privacy of their own home? Like, why would you say that she did that? Um, spiteful embarrassment. Yeah. I mean, and just uh, yeah. I mean, she was she was a not a very nice person, but also just so deeply disappointed. And it was just not something that she was, that she's going to get over. Yeah. And so she sort of, uh, like, even if not intentionally, it's sort of like rubbing it in, that, that we have to lie to you because you fucked up. Maybe if the students could stand up too when they ask the question, then we could see. See up there, yeah. <laughs> um, so in Who Will Greet You at Home, when your mom, or like when mama takes like the girl's happiness or stuff, what is she, like, I took it as she could have been, like, sexually assaulting the girls, like, when they go in the back room. Is oh, that we no. Oh, wow, that's amazing. That's a reading I never heard. No, no, no. It was, it was, it was what she was, like, it was that. Okay. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was taking their, their emotional capacity for happiness. Um, what it means when a man falls from the sky. I was just kind of curious if you would ever think about possibly making that into a movie. Um, if not, if you would possibly make a second part to that. Because I'm really stumped and I really want to know what happened. <laughs> I cannot answer that question. <laughs> because I am under contract. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of following up on her question on who will greet you at home, um, when the girl gives away like her most like mm -hmm. empathy, she loses that empathy. But when Mama takes it, it doesn't seem like she becomes any happier or more empathetic. Where does that go, and why does she take them? And why does she need them? To it's, less the baby. Yeah. So um, like the the I can only, I'll answer this because like like I place the clues there for anyone who is willing to dig around. So like the way again like asking myself logistical questions, right? And so one of the one of the things is that you know that that's sort of the rule of this world is that the girl's mother is the person who blesses the um, the uh, the child. And so you know mama is not any of these girls' mother. Um, and so she needs like a, a like essentially a battery for her magic. And that's what she uses that for. Like it's just it's just the way that her she powers herself up. Okay, I was wondering, um, you have a whole bunch of settings that are very wild, where you have a doorstep, you have a world where half the earth has been flooded, um, to a world where gods walk the earth. Um, do you have a favorite backdrop? Mm -hmm. of that um, that is a good question. Um, I really like, I really like it, the world of, um, what is it, volcano? Um, and um, in fact, like that uh, that particular story is um, is a prologue for something that's coming later. So we probably have time for one more question. Um, why do you pick the name? What it means when a man falls from the sky when the stories are basically about young women and mothers? So um, I will. I so. Long, like the short answer is that I ended up picking the most interesting title in the collection to be the title for the collection because that's apparently what you do. Um, the short answer is, I mean, the longer answer is that I initially, I was initially going to call the collection War Stories based on, you know, from, from the story, the title War Stories, and this idea of like, you know, like, People in this case, women and girls like at war with each other, war with themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then like, I was also like being sneaky, like oh, everyone expects you know uh, stories like, that are from Africa to be about war. And so like here's my being my way of like subverting that. And then and, and, and a friend of mine said no one's gonna no one's gonna get it. No one's gonna get that. No one's gonna get that. No one's gonna, like everyone's gonna this is gonna be this like oh a story story from you know, from Africa that's it's a war stories. Okay, like no one's gonna get like my joke. Um, and so and so I, you know so I essentially just like went. The, the question was like, okay, so what is the most interesting title in the collection? And so that's what we picked. Um, I 
There was no, I mean, so like there are no, with the exception of like Gucci's girls, right? There are no, none of the stories have like refer to women or girls in the title. Um, and so, and so like, and I didn't want, like, Gucci's girls was just too specific to be, to be used as the title for the collection. And I know that some folks, you know, will just sort of invent an entirely new title for the collection. But like I said, I'm really, really bad at that. And so I just, um, I, I, I used what I had, um, and and it's and it, it worked. Like it's the it's the um, it's even though it is uh, it's it's it is the most distinct story in the book. And so having that as the title um, has meant that. Uh, but I don't know, it, 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 I feel as though, even though I didn't intend it, it wasn't part of my choice, um, it wasn't like part of what I figured into my decision making, you know, the, the decision tree to decide this was going to be a title. I feel as though, because it is the most distinct story in the collection, it has come to like, signify a certain something. Um, and so I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with how, how it ended up. Thank you. So, two announcements. Uh, we will have, Leslie will be signing books, and if you're interested in getting your books signed, I'm going to ask you to start here and we'll make the line um, this way and then along the windows. And if you need an attendance certificate, you can get one from any of the lovely faculty people by the doors. And please, let's give Leslie Arima a everybody to, to our two o'clock uh, Two Rivers reading series event. This is our favorite event of the semester where we get to welcome the author that you many of you have been reading this semester um, of what it means when a man falls from the sky. Um, what it means when a man falls from the sky is Arima's intriguing and award-winning debut collection of short stories. Arima expertly takes readers on a journey between Nigeria and the United States, between mothers and daughters, and between suffering and love in energetic stories infused with a refreshing dose of humor. Arima won the Minnesota Book Award for Novel and Short Story in 2017, the 2017 Kirkus Prize, and the 2017 New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award for what it means when a man falls from the sky. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Arima. Welcome everyone, uh, I'm Professor Paige Real from the English Department and the Chair of the Two Rivers Reading Series and I'm thrilled that you're here today. I want to thank all of the faculty who used uh, Leslie's book in their classes. I know a lot of you have read it, you've written about it, you've talked about it in class, and we're happy to have you here. The format today is going to be an interview style where I'll be asking Leslie questions that were inspired by the questions turned in by students. So you might hear your own questions in here if you submitted some to your faculty member. If you don't and your questions don't get answered, we will save some time at the end of this session for questions from the audience. So have your question ready and we'll have a faculty member coming around with the microphone. So I wanted to uh, welcome Leslie and thank her because she flew in from Vermont today and she's flying back to Vermont tonight, so it's being a very long day for her. Uh, but we had a wonderful first session and, and we're happy to have her here for this session. So I am going to open with the same question I opened with for the first session because I know students are interested in your success and how you got where you are. And you just posted a couple days ago that you received another award for this book. And that was the 2018 Bridge Book Award in Fiction from the American Initiative for Italian Culture, an organization whose mission is to enrich the cultural exchange between the United States and Italy. So congratulations. Thank you. And how has this book changed your life as a writer? Um, it has, uh, hmm. it has, mm, it has given me an awareness of audience, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, and I try to ignore that awareness um, as much as I can. 
um, only if they like to you know, work uninterrupted and, and sort of without um, expectations and uh, uh, folks sort of reading that my neck waiting for the next thing. Um, but you know, it uh, it's, has essentially allowed me to um, have sort of structure uh, my creative life the way I want to. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, working in uh, teaching in spaces that I enjoy teaching in, like uh, workshops um, that happen over the summer. You know, if you guys are familiar with like Tin House and um, Red Oak, places like that. Um, and it, you know, I, I, I can sort of go in, teach there, and then leave before like. Everyone gets mad at me. It's a great, okay. <laughs> it's a perfect, perfect way. To, I, have, I have commitment issues, and so it's it's, it's uh, perfect. Um, but like my day to day life hasn't changed. I still have to think I'm in trash. I still have to wash my own dishes. Um, so it's it's hard. Like it's it's hard to like I don't think of myself as oh I'm and now this it's a very you know luminary a celebrity as in, you know beyond you know beyond little people whatever. But um, it's uh, so it's it's it's, it's strange. It's both strange that. Um, to have the awareness that people are looking at the, me, and but it also like my daily life has not really changed at all. So does that mean then, when you were working on this book and, and the individual stories, you weren't really thinking about audience, or did that does that come into play in your no, process? I mean, no, it, it doesn't. I mean, like yo, like nobody, 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 essentially, nobody gave a shit about what I was doing before the book came out. It's like you know, nobody was. Um, you know, nobody was looking for it, nobody was anticipating it, nobody was really interested. And of course, as an artist who, who like wants to be an artist in the world, that's, you know, that's its own like, little devastation. I know nobody, nobody cares. But I also come, I also come to realize how much freedom that gave me um, to to take my time, to to play with the work, to um, to you know, to essentially have it be a thing that exists just for me. Um, and those, and like that, that time was very useful and you know, as, as if you were an artist who, who you know, wants to be an artist in the world, like, you know, take advantage of the, the, the moments in which you are being ignored. Um, because that is where, that's sort of where you build a relationship with your work that does not depend on Validation from other people and does not uh, does not depend on attention from anyone other than yourself. And so, um, and so, like, yeah, my writing was you know my own thing, and I that and and so I and like I I I, I, I deeply appreciate that I had that moment. Yeah. And so now you're more cognizant of audience, and by audience are you thinking just the reader, or is it critics and your publisher and oh, all of that? No. As well? What a, uh, audience is more is mostly. When's the novel going to be done? Like, like it's, that's like that's um, what the question I'm getting now. In terms of like when, right? I mean, I'm able to compartmentalize. Like, I, I never consider um, like my when I write, I allow myself full selfishness in that I don't think about or care about anyone else, right? Uh, which just wouldn't work in like my real life. But when I'm writing, it works because. The story is what's important, and not about making people happy. Or, yeah, it's it's, it's the, the my allegiance is to the characters, to the story, to the narrative, and not to anything external. And because you know, you you cannot control uh, how people react to your work, right? Um, and so the only thing you can control is is your work. And so that's where I choose to um, to focus on. But the we but no for audience is more in terms of you know like. People like wanting to rush me to the next thing. Yeah. And speaking of the next thing, you had a, a short piece that you were going to read for us today. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, one of the ways that my life has changed with um, uh, the success of my book is that um, people actually ask me to write things for them now. Uh, and one of the things that I was asked to write was. Um, a, a Christmas story, um, and to which I said, have you actually read my work? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure this is a very good idea? Um, and so, um, and so I, I did. And so this is um, a uh, sort of a, a short piece that I wrote for a magazine um, looking for um, a story about Christmas. The Gift. 
Wrapped in a green so dark, it seemed to absorb light. I'm tied up with a bow the rusted red of old blood. It seemed to have appeared out of nowhere, though both husband and wife suspected the other of purchasing it. The twins, at eight months, were much too young to have placed it under the tree. They accused each other in a mellow, friendly way of going above and beyond the restrictions of their meager budget and asked for hints to the gift's contents, each swearing again and again that they didn't put it there. The husband became quite annoyed at his wife's insistence and was reminded, despite his efforts to forget, just how good of a liar she could be. The gentle teasing of the first few hours soured when the husband mother muttered under his breath, maybe it's from him, and they both understood him to be the guy from work, though it could have been her university boyfriend or the other guy from work, men she'd stepped out with over the course of their five-year relationship. You promised to never bring that up again, the wife said, hurt, and the husband, feeling guilty but mostly angry, left the house in a lather. He pulled out onto the busy street and drove until his temper and traffic cleared. He reminded himself of all the reasons he should make this work. The boys looked so much like him and his father before him that he was fairly certain they were his. His wife was probably telling the truth when she promised she'd never cheat on him again. It had taken him so long, mid-thirties, to find one wife, he couldn't really afford the time to seek another. Lastly, he loved her, didn't he? He called her then, looking for something he couldn't name, but got her voicemail and he turned to make the journey home. After the husband left, the wife picked up one of the twins, pressing kisses to the chubby fist he wrapped around her thumb while she went in search of her cell phone. She was always misplacing things, keys, wallet, morals. If anyone had told her three and a half years ago that the on-again, off-again situationship she was just biding her time with would eventually result in the twins, the nicest thing anyone had ever given her, she would have laughed herself silly. She called her sister, something she did almost every day, to catch up or complain about, well, everything, for she was a woman who enjoyed the cleansing expectorant of complaining. She did not notice how the boy struggled to get out of her arms only when her pacing brought her closer to the gift. I still can't believe you told him, her sister said, and the wife replied that she'd wanted a fresh start after the kids were born, and besides, that last time had been so long ago, when he'd assumed they were exclusive and she thought they were still complicated. It was a conversation the wife had had with her sister many times. But you'd gotten away with it, and the wife almost said, but didn't, that marriage was different than whatever her sister had with whoever it was she was seeing now. That was also a conversation, well, argument, they'd had many times, and it usually ended with weeks of silence. Instead, she told her sister about the gift and how the husband had pretended it wasn't his and how that led to, wait, her sister said, hold on. Is it a green box with a red bow? Yes, the wife said, laughing, misunderstanding. Don't tell me it's yours. When did you sneak it in? And her sister said in a quite uncertain tone, no, it's just, I got one too. I thought it was from you. When the husband returned, he found the house ransacked, pillows and pots strewn about like the aftermath of a storm or a fight. Heart pounding, he ran to the twins' room to find the door locked. He knocked, yelled, then hearing no response, kicked, praising cheap contractors when the door splintered open at his second try. They were both there, sleeping, safe, unbothered by the racket he'd made, but his wife wasn't with them, nor was she in any other room. In the living room, he collapsed onto the couch, furious, furious that his wife seemed to have had a fit and left the children alone in the house. It was so unlike her, yet just like her, to try and turn this into her hurt. He was about to make a few angry calls when he noticed the gift now open. Well, not open exactly, but shredded, splayed as though something had clawed its way out. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Um, you know, I really love uh, Diane Cook, 
and she wrote probably one of my favorite collections ever, um, Man Versus Nature. And, um, you know, I was just talking about this a couple minutes ago, but, you know, when I graduated from my MFA program, and I was like, oh, you know, I wanted to get, you know, I wanted you know, to make this whole writing thing work as a career, um, I started looking at, like, you know, submitting my work to contests, and et cetera, et cetera. And I came across um, her, one of her stories. It was titled Somebody's Baby that had won um, like the Italo Calvino Prize. And I remember reading it and just sort of being blown away because I, I did not realize that this was something you could do um, with fiction. And so at that time she didn't have a collection out. She was, that was just like a story that had won. And so, but like that, you know, that, that story of hers sort of, you know, set me on a path, um, just realizing just how much I needed I had yet to learn about uh, storytelling, and so um, and so when is I so I later encountered her the full collection, which had come out sometime after that her story won that contest, and I, I encountered it when I was um, like after like I finished mine and everything, but, you know, and, I, and I and I read it and found every story there to be just as effective as. Um, as the, the story that I read, um, you know, so long ago, and so it was, you know, she's a writer who, who I, I, I admire quite a bit. Thank you. So I'm going to go to a couple of specific stories that questions uh, students had questions about. Um, some students had asked if these stories were based on real people, and for example, Noah Bexel asked, like the father in war stories, if like the father in war stories, your father fought in a war, and other students asked if possibly the protagonist of that story has any of your characteristics. Okay. Um, this is really funny because this is the only, this is the only story in the collection that is actually based somewhat in uh, truth and in, 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 uh, things that happen, not to me, but to, to my father. So the stories that the father tells the daughter are stories that my father told me. And so, um, with the last story, I you know I sort of like you know, did my writer thing at it, and like you know took it beyond what he you know, where he ended it. But like those like the earlier stories, like almost almost exactly word for word stories that my father told me about when he was um, when he was um, in the army. And so, and that that is the only time right that that um, I pulled uh, facts directly, and then you know. Um, Directly from my from my own real life, and so I don't write autobiographical work. Um, so, for example, the protagonist of war stories, she's not me, right? And I, and I was, I was, I, I, you know, I, I was, I was never that interesting as a child. Um, but you know, but but I, you know, like you know, I I, I gave her, um, I, I gave her something. Of me in that I gave her like in in, in this story anyway that she has she's somewhat irreverent right and like I, I and that's like a personality trait that I have now and so I, and but you know it's not it's not the same as like drawing facts from um, from uh, my own life uh, to to write a story it's just uh, you know. Pop, like, you know, basically creating a person, right? And so it's a combination of imagination, invention, and just like the things you know about the world. Yeah. So another question that uh, was about the two stories: the father losing the or the losing of the gun, and the other about snakes. Or those actual stories then that your father had kind of passed the down. Losing of the gun, yes. Um, that was that was that was uh, real. The snake story only up until the part where the lieutenant scolded them about like, shooting the snake. And then after the, the, the stuff after that, I made up. But yeah. And so you dedicated the book to your father. Is that because there's a little bit of him in it, or? Well, okay. So you can, you can never tell him this. <laughs> this this he might have access to it. <sighs> Just no one bring it to his head, his attention. So I knew that I was going to dedicate my novel to my mother. So I was like, I should probably just, I should probably do this one to my dad so that it doesn't cause like a thing. I mean, no, I know it sounds awful, right? But I mean, of course, I, I, I love him and I cherish him. But like, the novel very specifically sort of tied into something like the, like you know, it's like you know, it's something, something that I had with my mother, like as a child. And so I, you know, it was very, like, it was very specific dedication. And for this one, I was like, I just, I thought, like, it's not that I wouldn't, like, a, you know, nothing is worthy, of it. he's not worthy of being dedicated to something to, of course he is. Um, but I just, I figured, okay, if, you know, if I'm going to dedicate a novel to my mom, I should probably, like, 
got to keep one foot up to my dad, and this one came out first, so I was like, <laughs> uh, so there's a question submitted, uh, similar questions by student Jeremy Behrens and Emma Farnsworth, uh, asking about, is it common practice for people in Nigeria to come to the United States for education and then to return to their homeland uh, as the mother intended to do in light, and you have some other uh, characters that leave as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty common. Um, most, uh, yeah, it's, it's common to, yeah, to go come here for university and then and then go back, go back home. And are there different cultural expectations, would you say, uh, from parents in Nigeria? You know, we have a lot of expectations on certain characters like Glory Be to God, right? It's that the, the weight of that name on her birth um, and other characters as well. Do you think there are cultural differences? Um, well, I think, you know, I, you know um, it's, it's uh, I mean, like, I feel like, I feel like sort of like middle class people are the same everywhere, um, except that like Nigerians are, Nigerians, Nigerians are a little extra, right? And so um, in that, uh, uh, like the, the expectations are, are, tend to be very, very heavy in, in what uh, parents expect of their children, especially, you know, in um, you know, in the case of the you know the mother in light who's you know getting education and coming back, so she's a fully grown adult. So you know that's different. But like when parents send their you know their teenagers to college, to back, you know there's you know because they're sending them you know abroad, um, you know, and if they're sending them abroad, and then of course you know if they're an international student, like there's the cost of being an international student, and so like there like there is a lot of expectation on there but it's also like a class signifier essentially that someone is able to come, to come as an international student and pay the and then you know so it's, it's um yeah i think it's you know so like okay, there's a whole societal like ecosystem around it yeah like a very passage so um we talked in the earlier session about the story that the one story that you second person you there was also a question from taylor eagleman about why you didn't give the girl a name in light like, she was just called the girl yes okay so um that was uh, there's this sort of thing so you know there is a certain quality of language with light where there's almost a fairy tale aspect to it, um, and uh, and I think I want it, even though it's a it's a very specific girl, and um, and a very specific situation, I wanted to lend the illusion of archetype to it, and so I and so I, I left her unnamed and just the girl to almost to almost um, you know. Like almost to make the the case that this is a thing that happens with with all girls, right? You know, even with that, but just again, just um, pretending at archetype. Yeah. And in that story too, there's a continuation of the theme of the strained relationships between mothers and daughters. And so, student Brooke Byer asked. On page 60 in Light, the main character is criticized by her mother for the way she presents herself, her clothing, her hair, her posture, but the mother believes she's doing what's best for her daughter, even though it's damaging her daughter's confidence. Do you believe that the mother's behavior is justified as being a good mother, or is that an example of a mother causing harm? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think that the mother, um, I mean, you know, she is a good mother in like the in the society that she is, you know, involved in. And in fact, I mean, parents do that all the time, right? And like, you know, um, if anyone has, if anyone has ever like attended a, a church that that requires like dressing up, right? So, you know, not, not all churches are like that. But, you know, so it's like you know, like you shoe check. Blah, blah. Like it, it was, it's just sort of like a normal thing that that like you know parents do in this case mothers do um, and so it was not it was not to you know it was not to signal that the mother was bad she's not a bad mother right she's she's um, you know she might be a little more like direct than like you know than, uh, than like, you know the girl appreciates but she's not she's not like a bad person but that's not the, but that's not the point the point is that even not by not being a bad person even by doing what she knows is best for her daughter she is like she is uh, you know compromising something in, in her in the girl yeah. so when you write a story like that are you often thinking of some major plot points first or do, do characters come first for you 
Um, it depends. It depends on the story. Some stories, um, uh, like the, the like no, let's see, like like the title story. What it means when man falls from the sky. In that case, it was um, it was the the situation, the, the setting, the plot, like the, the plot happened first. It's the situation where the premise of the story happened first. Um, in a story like um, the future looks good, I actually had an idea of structure. Before, um, before much of the story came to me, um, but stories like Wild, it was the character, and it was like you know, it was the character was who was who um, appeared first. So it just um, each story had their own particular origin. When you're revising, do you uh, do you find yourself revising revising for the same sorts of things? Do you go back in and think, oh, I need to make this character a little more multifaceted, or is it more like, oh, I need to? pick up the pace of the plot, or does it just depend on the story? Um, I don't know, because all of my first shots are perfect, so I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, uh, you know, usually it, uh, I, I usually, the revisions tend to be plot-based, right? Um, especially in cases where I have, like, a chatty narrator, like, you know, the, like, the protagonist of, um, in the wild, who, like, is very voicey. Um, you know, so, you know, like, I'm having a lot of fun with the voice, and so, like, there's a lot of talking, a lot of thinking, a lot of snarkiness, but, like, not a lot of, like, stuff happening. And so, um, and so, like, in cases like that, like, I, I go through and, um, and, uh, see, like, what I, like, what I missed, right? And, and I, and I always, when I'm, when I'm doing revisions, Especially when I'm not satisfied with the story, I always think of um, ways to complicate things um, and complicate things in the sense that not just like oh let me you know insert an alien invasion and now what is well now what's glory gonna do right um, but more that uh, like the story needs more than one thing happening at the same time like whatever the whatever like the general premise or idea of the story right um, like you know we you know the, the idea. When we write, right, we want to, we want our characters to have the texture of realism, right? Um, and even with stories that are not real, I want there to be a texture of realism. And for me, part of that is uh, acknowledging in the text, like that, like in real life, we are um, like we are more than one thing at the same time, more than one thing is happening around at the same time, and and you know things like. You know, things that things will intersect with us that like happens off the page, like off the page essentially, right? Like um, you know, like this this room, we're all in this room right now, um, but like this is this is not. I know it's surprising. This is not the only thing that's happening right now. I am not the center of the universe. Like, you know, like, like you know, there's a, there's a whole world out there where um, you know, and and maybe I might uh, you know on our way to the airport might run into um, the lot run into like. Please don't. Um, but like you, know, like you might be like, like end up stuck behind somebody who you know, um, you know, uh, who works for my account or something. It's, it's like you know, like we're like we have. There's an entire ecosystem that lives around us as people, and you know, I want to at least like reflect that in some way. Of course, we can't do that level of breath with them in, in, in a short story, but I want to reflect that in some way, and so. I always think, okay, well, what else can be happening that's not just like the thing? Like, what's the thing beyond the thing? Which is like my very erudite way of saying that. And so you had kind of mentioned, you know, when we have uh, human characters, but you do have a story in here with an ant in a river. So Laurel Smith's class asked, is what a what is a volcano an allegory? Can you expand on the meaning of the story? It is not an allegory. It is an ant, a god of ants, and the god of goddess of rivers having at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I've always loved mythology. I've always loved, um, you know, reading like the, you know, the Greek myths and then you know the stone versions of it and the and you know and, and you know Nigerian mythology and the, just, just all mythology. I've always just like I just always, um, you know, from very a very young age, been fascinated by. And so I, I, I'm going to write my own myth. I'm going to write a myth. Um, and so that was that, that was what it was looking at. And some of those same students wanted to know why aren't there more stories like what is a volcano in the collection? Um, that's a good question. You know, I I haven't written any story other stories like what is a volcano yet, right? Um, 
I, uh, you know, I, I initially sort of had a, a, a vision of, you know, third, like, I wanted to do 13 stories in the collection, right? And, um, something about the numbering, some like numerology bullshit, right? And so, um, yeah, and and, uh, and so you know, once I once I had the stories, like I kind of nobody stopped. I didn't stop writing. In fact, like you know, I, there were stories that didn't make it and etc. But um, but I you know I sort of I was happy with the range that the that the story and, and, and Funny enough, Waters of Volcano was one of the stories that was written later. Um, you know, sort of when I realized that I was working on a book, right? Because you know, I was just when I started off, I was just writing individual stories, and I had not yet conceptualized them as an entire book. And so, um, and so, you know, and so it was one of the ones that I wrote later, and it's it, like it, it rounded out the offerings of the book in a way that I didn't know it needed at the time, right? Um, and so, um, you know, it, it was actually you know, I actually stole it from um, on something else I was working on. So it's it's the prologue of of a novel, and I just I made it. Um, Stories. And is that the novel you're working on right now? No. Different novel. Different one. And so do you, I, I know you just said that your publisher's on you about deadlines and stuff, so I'm oh, a little they, cautious they, to they ask you this. Now, okay. Yeah. Do you have a, an estimated completion? The, no. Okay. You know, the deadline has come and gone and come and gone and come and gone a couple of times. And so I think that, um, I, and I, I, I can't be rushed. I mean, like, you know, I, I used to love a deadline, and I used to find them like very energizing. And I think that that might work for shorter pieces, but for the novel, like it's um, like no, you know, this is it's such a it's such a, it's its own like you know extremely large animal, and you cannot you cannot get it to run if it won't run. So. Yeah. And so, in a related question, a couple of students had asked, was there any one story in here that you struggled with writing more than the others, and if so, why? Um, the last story, Redemption. So I started off that story, um, like the like parts that parts of that story existed. Like it's probably one of the oldest stories in the collection in terms of like bits that have, that have you know have, to have um, survived time and like you know myself growing as a writer. Um, and so I started off the story a long time ago, um, you know, long before I I really even knew what I was doing. Um, and I could not get it, the story to like act, act right. I, I could not, I could not figure out what. I, I knew something was wrong. Could not figure it out, and did not know how to fix it. And so I put it away, and um, and then you know like learn to write. Um, and then when I eventually, so I eventually came back to it. Um, after, after I had most of these stories had already been written, so I was like, you know, went out there compiling the collection. I was like, okay, let's pull out redemption, and I kept another crack at it. And I, you know, I had like my, you know, like my the way I conceptualized stories, like my my skill level had changed to the point that I instantly saw what the problem was and was able to to fix it. Yeah. Would you mind reading the last couple of sentences from that story? Because we have a question uh, from Laurel Osterkamp's class. Can you talk about the last line of redemption? Is the narrator physically throwing something, or is this an emotional release? All right. Um, I found her in the kitchen, scrub scrubbing the floor so spitefully it might have been punishment in addition to chores. She spat on the tile and ground it into the grout like she, grout like she was laying a curse on the foundation of the house. She hadn't yet noticed me, and I stepped back to watch her for a while. After a few minutes of angry, frantic scrubbing, her arms began to falter, and she leaned back on her haunches, wiping the sweat off her face with the hem of her dress. No, not sweat. She continued to clean, sucking the tears into her mouth when she tasted salt. I backed away even further, knowing this wasn't something she wanted me to see. She wasn't my friend. She wasn't here to fight for me or love me. She was just as powerless another daughter being sent back to her mother in disgrace. My thanks felt foolish under the glare of this truth. Girls with fire in their bellies will be forced to drink from a well of correction until the flames die out. But my tongue stirred anyway. I stepped into view and threw something on my own. Um, it is very much an emotional throw. It wasn't like born a stone, that poor girl. Um, it was, yeah, it was a, it was the narrator sort of finally um, like 
finding the word and courage to to like sort of like fight back, right? And not not as not a girl, it's like fight back at the situation of her life and everything. Yeah. So if that was the the story that you struggled with the most, have you had any stories that you would consider like a gift that kind of came and you didn't have to revise very much and feel good about them? Um, life was one of those. It was. It was. Um, yeah. It was one of those serendipitous, and like, oh God, oh to, oh to recreate that moment, right? Um, it, yeah, it was like one of those serendipitous moments where I, um, this, was, this, was, this is where like the energy of the, the, the deadlines can be energizing, where I wanted to submit it for a thing, and I, I did not know that I had that story like, in, but it, it had to have been in my subconscious somewhere, because, um, um, because yeah, because it, you know, it, it came out, and it, you know, it, it, and it came out, pretty clean in terms of, like, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah. So one class wanted to know, has the process of writing this book given you a sense of empowerment through sharing your voice with the public on such a large spectrum? No. Um, I, what I mean, is like, I, I don't know, I don't, um, I guess I, I don't know, I, I, I am wary of sort of word empowerment and sort of the way it has been somewhat bastardized um, over the, uh, the last couple of years. And so I don't, so so what I'm thinking about empowerment is that like, you know, we're talking about like, you know, oh, it's breast cancer, women's one, something wear a pink shirt, not power. Is like, is, is that what we're, you know? And so, um, like, I, I don't know what I don't know what is meant entirely by empowering, but I'm suspicious of it. Um, so I would say I would say no, um, and also I don't I don't know. I, I the thing with um, like validation, right, is that there is like validation and attention exist in the same space, but they're not the same thing. And so I am I I'm aware that. Uh, like, the, the, it would be empowering, I think, if I, if that was something that I was seeking, right? Um, and it's not something I'm avoiding either, but it's not, like, I, I don't draw, I don't, I don't draw or try very hard not to, and then, so, like, if largely succeed, I don't draw. Like I don't, I don't make validation part of my satisfaction, right? Because it's a thing that can disappear at any moment, and I have no control over when validation can turn to, you know, from just like positive attention to negative attention. Like, I just don't. There's nothing I can, I can, um, I can. I have no control over it, and so it's like a. I, I think of it as a dangerous thing to hinge, um, like something like feeling empowered on. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to take the last 10 minutes to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, we're going to ask that you raise your hand and uh, Professor Hyde will come around with the, um, with the microphone. And we'll ask that you just ask one question. If you're on the edge, she's going to hang on to that microphone and then uh, give it back to her if you're in the middle so she can get to the next student. We can ans answer as many questions as possible. Um, yeah. Ben Tenius, Kansas I, um, student newspaper. Uh, what, you know, uh, what, why, uh, I'm trying to phrase this right, why, the, why are you here is not the best way of like saying like, um, there are other colleges and other places that, what, 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 in, what you know, what is, made you want to come here and talk to us, rather than like Harvard or, you know, a more a more prestigious class. This sounds really mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How are we so lucky? Thank you. Um, the goddess Paige Rio. <laughs> no, you know, so Paige invited me, and I said yes. It really is that simple. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Also, fame is a consolation prize. What you're saying, right? Really, like admiration is like a consolation. Um, so. I grew up with uh, posters of Biafran children in the schools because that time was around the War of Independence and the crisis of, of starving children. So, um, and it figures in, in, in your stories. And I was wondering uh, what you know Biafra means to you, and 
and, and how you see it today, I guess, as compared to um, what I presume would be before your birth um, on the about the war of independence and how that uh, figures with your you know your parents and everything else like that. Um, I mean, it is not something that that really I really contemplate. Um, it was a sort of a specter in my youth in that my father, you know, he has a, you know, a, a bullet scar in his leg and, you know, my mother, some of her first, some of her like, early memories were of, were of, you know, were of some of that, some of that hunger. Um, and so it was like a, it was a, a sort of a ghost in the background, right? Um, because nobody talked about it. It was just, it was one of those things where, like, everyone had decided, um, I mean, I'm sure there were people who were, who were talking about it, who obviously, you know, there were books written on the topic, et cetera, but just like in societal conversation, it was just not a thing that people, um, people spoke about, really. Um, and, you know, part of the, the um, justification, I think, for that was to not, the people didn't want to burden their children with this, which is, you know, which, which is not, I mean, you know, there's, there is no, there's no way, you can't, it's not a, you can't erase something like that from, by not, you know, from, from a society by not talking about it. And so, um, and so, but because of that, you know, because it was not, you know, like, it would have been different if, you know, my parents were, you know, uh, constantly airing their grievances about the war, um, especially like the, sort of the post-war um, period, which was probably, you know, um, some, of, you know, some of the most um, affecting uh, uh, occurrences where, you know, people who owned land and property were, you know, had its, you know, returned to find, like, their house under new ownership, for example, right? You know, so, you know, but, you know, they did not, and so because they did, they did, it was not, because it was like a ghost and it was not a, uh, it was not something that, that they spoke to us and, like, you know, fed into our bones and remember, you know, um, it was, it, it was discovering, discovering the war on my own and the details of it helped me to understand my, like, it helped me, like, it helped to like, fill in blanks and to understand where, some of like, where my parents are coming from about, about certain things, but it's not something that, like, I, I, I have, like, I have, like, intellectual ideas about it, but I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have a sort of like personal anger, right? And um, and and you know I, I have family who do who do have who will carry this lasting anger, um, and so it is. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. Um, so, are there any things that you kind of go to if you're experiencing like writer's block? Like, what are some things that you just can always kind of go to? Writer's block is a myth. Okay. <laughs> First of all. For you. Um, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I get, I get periods of like writer's block. What I mean is a myth. So usually, right? Usually, when I experience writer's block, maybe, maybe I'm extrapolating my experiences too much. So when I experience writer's block, it's usually one of two things: either I'm just having a lazy ass day and I don't want to work, or I'm stuck in that I don't know what happens next. I don't know what happens next, and so I don't know where to go, and I just, so I, 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 like, I just don't know what to write. Um, and so, uh, and so instead of like, you know, so for me, it's the, the, what is, you know, the way to get over this, you know, writer's block, but this thing you, you guys call writer's block. And for me, it was like, okay, figure out like, what, come, like, what comes next? So with my novel, for example, right, like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm stuck right now, but it's like, it's like a, it's not like a frustrating stuck, it's a productive struck, stuck in that, um, you know, I got rid of thirty thousand words, and um, and so now, like, the, the, this entire storyline is gone, and so now I have like I'm like I'm figuring out the new story, right? And so um, I have like if I if I were to sit down and try to write, like I I I would that I would have writer's block essentially because I uh, I would not like I. I don't know what happens next. And so what I'm doing now is I am 
uh, I am turning the story over in my head, and I am, you know, I'm, I'm, re I'm reading what I do have, like, you know, I'm reading what I do have, and thinking, like, what, because, you know, I have, I have a pretty decent chunk, and so I know that whatever happens next has already been set up, right? It exists somewhere in this text, I just need to find it. Right, I just need to find where I need to find where the story is, and so um, and so and so that's what I'm doing. So it's like I, I don't feel because I don't feel blocked, right? So I don't I get it, because I know the source of like this block is that I just don't know what's what's what's, what's what comes next, and so um, and so now that I'm turning the story over my head and like doing uh, like just like sort of it's just it's there, it's there. I'm playing it in my subconscious. I am you know, reading what I have, and then I am asking myself, like, what did I overlook? What can I exploit for, for, yeah, for story? I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. So how long did it take you to write your novel? Like, even like the rough draft and everything that's included in that process to get it to that perfect ending stage? Uh, well, I'm still writing it. So like the whole process, so prior to, like everything that led up to even starting to type it, you know, even like the title and just all the nitpicky things, okay. and then actually starting to write, like in general, maybe an estimate of how long it would take? My entire life. I've been talking everything that would, I mean, again, I have to like, it's like become, my, have to become me, right, you know? Well, no, so um, I, you know, there was, you know, there was, I, so the first, the first, the first, first ever draft of my novel was written in uh, roughly nine months, the most of it taking, uh, being written in this, like, a, like an intense three month period. It was absolute crap. Um, so it's not, like it's not something that I would, I think, thank God, it's not out of the world, right? Um, and so, so like, you know, like, because, you know, I had to write that, I, I had to write that, you know, yet to the, you know, do the shitty first draft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the process of writing the, the, this draft, you know, um, so I had my, my protagonist, and then there was a the antagonist, right? And at some point, you know, the antagonist was like, I want to talk to you. And so we got some of the antagonist backstory, and I am stuck trying to figure out how do I make the front story and like my sort of you know lily livered protagonist is interesting as this person in the back story because this is kind of taking over and like you don't like that's the story that's where the story is and so i threw the entire draft away and started it from the perspective of the antagonist and holy cow it was a much better book um, and like you know i had a, had a character who was doing something other than like crying it was great um, and so um, and so you know so I, I, I wrote that and then and then I got to a point I got to a point where I was where I was like you know I, I, I wasn't I, I, was, I was like kind of I wasn't stuck exactly but it felt like a natural stopping point for um, the a particular storyline that, that was being written and then I when I was trying to figure out what came next you know, this other protagonist, this other, this story that I'd written out just kind of kept sort of whispering to me. So, that, okay, let me, this is going to be like a dual narrative novel, and so now I'm going to write, so 30, 25, 30,000 words uh, from this other, this from you, from this character coming back. And it was still crap. Oh my goodness. It was, it was absolutely awful. And, um, and my, my antagonist stopped talking to me because she was like, how dare you request that I share this book with this, this, her? And so, um, and so, uh, and so I threw that away. And, and now, so now, now, I'm, now it's like, okay, what's the real story, right? Um, and so like all of that stuff, like the novel isn't finished yet, but all of that writing, all, everything I threw away was necessary to get me to this point. Right, everything that I, you know, you know writing that, the, the first, the very first draft with this, you know, with this, you know, very terrible, you know, this character who was just reacting to things and had no for, for momentum led me to the villain who was and ended up being the protagonist of the novel. And, you know, and I didn't, I didn't 
pivoting back to her, this character because I cared about her, pivoting back to her, you know, pathetic person she was, pivoting back to her, um, and, and writing it out, and then having and then to throw it away again, it really just, it, it got rid of it. Like I got rid of that, I got this way out of my system. I got it out of my system. And so, um, and so, uh, I'm still writing it. Yeah, so like I don't, when, I, when it's done, I can give you an exact answer for how long it took. But so, you know, I can say that you know, the first crappy draft was about about nine-ish months. The rewrite where I tossed the um, tossed everything out and started from the beginning that was um, much shorter, only because I was uh, in a I was at a residency and I writing was all I was doing. Um, and then um, and then so and then so this all, the entire the second draft all of it took about a year. And then I threw half of it away, and so now I have half, and we'll see. So since this book is finished, and we have to wrap it up after this, but from the initial seed of the first story here to the publication date, how many years would you estimate that was? Oh, see, I don't know. Okay, when you say seed. <laughs> like, okay, let's say the first a word that you wrote of one of these stories. <laughs> um, that is a good question. So. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna say that you know the the, the real like so like the, the answer that makes sense math wise is three years, but uh, but that's just when the first like that's when I wrote the first word that appeared in you know appeared in the first story. There was I mean there were there was three uh, three years between like when I graduated when I. That's my MFA program, and when I started writing the work that would eventually appear here, which was a really intense period of just learning, learning more about how stories work, learning more about how to write, and none of that, none of this would have happened without, without that. All that. Counts. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't know if this is on or not. Um, we have to wrap it up here, but we do have time for some book signing. If you're interested, you can come on up, and we'll start the line running this way and around the corner. If your question didn't get answered, you can have a moment while Leslie's signing your book to ask her the question. If you need an attendance certificate, you can get one at the door. And let's please get Leslie. Do you want to have half of this?